want to uh, welcome you to the 18th annual 3C2A convention. And uh, just a few housekeeping things before uh, we get started. Uh, I'd ask that uh, you silence your cell phones, put them on buzz before you forget. We don't want, uh, is Rich Coleman in the room? Okay, we don't want the Michigan fight. We don't want the Michigan fight song going off in the middle of the in the middle of the keynote. So, just one time, yeah, one time, every time. Uh, as we kick off, you know, we've we've uh, already had a kind of a full day of of meetings, and management council's been here uh, already working on some things, and affiliate orgs have gotten underway. Um, Today, uh, we really kick things off with our, our keynote address, uh, so several uh, sessions, including an, uh, uh, an NCAA academic uh, update uh, from uh, representatives from the NCAA. We uh, have what's always one of the highlights of our convention is the celebration of Scholar Athlete Luncheon. Uh, We'll also have uh, some affiliate org meetings, uh, an annual eligibility requirement workshop, which is done with uh, Carolyn and, and Lydia, They're doing a great job. Uh, later on this afternoon, uh, Roy and the TV Dodd uh, and a host of athletic directors will be leading a workshop on athletic leadership hot topics and close out the day. Uh, with uh, our Hall of Fame banquet. So uh, we have a jam-packed uh, day of activities, but the, really one of the things that, that I enjoy doing is uh, trying to connect with folks and bring in uh, what I think are some outstanding individuals to provide uh, keynotes address uh, for us really to get us underway. And uh, really couldn't have found a, a better person uh, to provide a keynote uh, for this year's convention than Dr. Ted Leland. Uh, Ted grew up in Northern California, graduated from Hayward High School, and later attended Chabot College. Interesting enough, uh, our Hall of Fame inductee was one of his former coaches who indicated that uh, he was a two-way player, a great football player at Chabot. Uh, he uh, earned his bachelor's degree in uh, 19, 1970 and master's in 72 from the University of Pacific. Prior to uh, adding a PhD from Stanford in 1982 in education and sports psychology. While at an undergraduate at Pacific. Ted earned first team all PCAA football honors as a defensive end in 1969. He later coached football at Pacific, Stanford, and East Tennessee State. Somewhere along the line, you know, he became the athletic director at Stanford and set a standard uh, at Stanford that continues to this day. Um, he set in place a structure and foundation of formula that continues to be the envy of major college athletics with the winning of 20 consecutive, whatever they're calling it these days, Sears, Directors, uh, Learfield Cups, symbolizing excellence uh, in intercollegiate athletics. Uh, Ted has returned to the University of Pacific in 2006 as the vice president for university adv advancement. He had an immediate impact as he reorganized the university's annual giving operation under the umbrella of the new Pacific Fund and began awarding Pacific Fund grants to deserving undergraduates by the spring of 2007. He then helped secure the largest gift in school history in May of 2007 as the university announced a $100 million bequest from the estate of Robert and Jeanette Powell. Ultimately, by the time the gift was received, 
by the university in October of 20, uh, 2013, the Powell and his state had grown in value to 125 million. Good job, Ted. <laughs> Uh, since taking over as Pacific's Director of Athletics in 2011, leading overseas Pacific Athletics while guiding the implementation of Pacific's new strategic plan for intercollegiate athletics, a plan that he and former Athletic Director Lynn King created while working together over the previous year. He immediately reinvigorated the athletics annual giving operation as he transformed the Pacific Tigers Athletics Association back into the Pacific Athletic Foundation and began requiring donor gifts in order to, for alumni and boosters to gain access to the best seats in the Spano Center. In three short years, fundraising grew from 144,000 in fiscal year 12 up to 400,000 in fiscal year 15. Dr. Gre Dr. Leland's greatest legacy, however, will be the myriad of facility upgrades for Pacific Athletics, including recent projects such as the field hockey turf field, the rainy sand volleyball courts, Bill Simone, field upgrades, softball dugouts, lights, and scoreboard. Well, I'm going to butcher this one. Chris Yeltsin, pool upgrades lights and bleachers, and the baseball cover performance facilities. Leland's peers and colleagues have honored him on several occasions. He's been pre presented with the Dick Enberg Award by Cosida in 2004. In 2000, 2000, 2001, Leland was honored by the NACTA and by Streets and Smith Sports Business Journal as Athletic Director of the Year. He's been inducted into several Halls of Fame, including the 3C2A Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to, to announce our keynote address, Dr. Ted Newman. Thanks a lot. I, uh, um, I got to redo that bio to get the dates of my graduation out of there. I'm sure you guys, guys are doing the, trying to do the math thinking, you know, are they, in, in, when he graduated, had they invented the electric light bulb yet? Uh, um, but I came today because of, uh, uh, first of all, so for me it's sort of old home week. I know a lot of people in the room that I've worked with at different places. I even have a UOP fraternity brother who's here and uh, um, from my undergraduate days in, and uh, so it's a, it's, it's a fun for that part of it. But I think the real reason is, uh, Two, one is, I, is I, I really think that all those of us in athletics have to be values driven. I think it is sort of it all starts with us and, those, and, the, and what starts with us has to be a, a set of values that we can believe in. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and try to put that in perspective with the huge influx of dollars and opportunities that have come from uh, uh, television. Uh, and how that affects sort of all of us as we try to try to manage this world of, uh, of athletics. Um, but the other part of it is, is I, I, I really uh, am, was immeasurably, in my opinion, changed by my junior college experience. Um, I went to Chabot College during the middle of the Vietnam War. Uh, um, uh, the first year I was there was the Summer of Love in San Francisco. The uh, uh, Civil Rights Movement was happening in, uh, in the Deep South and the South. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, two years after, or a year after I graduated, Martin Luther King and, and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated. Uh, the Tet Offensive happened. I mean, it was a uh, it was a very very traumatic time in America. And the junior college, Chabot College, gave me sort of a chance to to grow up a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I, but I, and, and I really have to credit my coaches. Now I, I saw Keith Calkins is here, and so I'm going to. I played football at Chabot before self-esteem was a big deal. Um, <laughs> the, I first realized that we had, a, we, had a, we had a line coach named Gene Wellman who uh, um, ran the off-season conditioning program and during the spring of my s freshman year at Chabot we were in our off-season conditioning program. It wasn't nearly as difficult or as well thought out as it is today. But, the, uh, uh, the Six Day War had just broken out. We were, so we were fighting in Vietnam. This is the years of the draft. So all of us were expecting to be drafted at some point in time. 
and uh, where the Americans were fighting in Vietnam, and the Six-Day War in, uh, in uh, Israel broke out, and uh, um, everybody was uh, uh, afraid what was going to be the next step. And uh, uh, Coach Wellman's uh, sympathetic thought was on that. He said, he said, you know what, guys? Uh, you think it's hot in Vietnam? Wait till you go to uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, really hot there. You're going to get in shape. After my, uh, about the third game of my freshman year, at Chabot, um, well, we lost to somebody, I think it was College of San Mateo, but we hadn't, we hadn't played very well. And Coach Wellman was sort of a, a, a beloved figure at, at Chabot College, and I think throughout junior colleges, he was really kind of well thought of, as just kind of, but he was a character. And, but we all loved him. In those days, there was uh, um, uh, about 30, 30, 40 linemen on the team, and we were hitting that old seven-man sled after this very uh, upsetting loss pushing around the field on Monday, and, and we're getting all sweaty and everything, hitting this sled, hitting this sled. And he stops everybody, and he said, um, I got to talk to you guys. I, I, I got to talk to you guys. So we all gather around him. Everybody's perspiring and breathing hard. And Coach Wellman said, you know, all I've ever, this is him speaking now, all I've ever wanted to do, you guys, is coach. When I was in eighth grade, I wanted to coach. When I was in high school, I wanted to coach. Um, I went to, uh, uh, he went to University of Pacific, I went to college, that's all I ever want to do is coach, I've got a great career coaching. I've loved every minute of it. He said, but after that game Saturday, I went home and told my wife, I gotta get out of coaching. I gotta get out of coaching. And he turned to me and he said, Leland, I'm not gonna let you drive me out of coaching. <laughs> so I, I, I felt about that big. Uh, <laughs> So, but he ended up being one of my best friends. As a matter of fact, he, uh, uh, when I was at Stanford, he was a, a pro baseball scout and would come to almost all of our baseball games. And in, in fact, he, when I had some, some choices when I came out of uh, 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 being a football player at Chabot and I had some choices where to go to school, he was really the one person I looked to to, to help me uh, um, sort of make that decision. I do know Bruce Werner is, is uh, going to be uh, inducted into your Hall of Fame tonight. I think that's certainly uh, a deserving a apropos, I guess. I, I would say one, one uh, a comment, and this is a true story. Bruce, he was, the, he was the tennis coach, I think, but he also coached football. So he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't kind of a football guy, but he, we needed him, and he coached wide receivers. And, but he, every time, he, when I played for there, every time he looked at me, he would kind of smile and go, Leland. You know, just Lee, like like what kind of a what kind of a goofball are you? And uh, uh, so finally, right as I after I got through playing, I was walking across campus, uh, and I said, uh, "Hi, coach. How are you?" He said, coach, he said, "Ted, I want to talk to you for a second. And he looked at me and he said, "You know," um, and, and I told this story before. He said, "Leland, you don't have to be a knucklehead your whole life." Um, and, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe I don't have to be a knucklehead. <laughs> um, the uh, so, in addition to the coaches that I knew at Chabot, though, I, I met some professors there that, that really, I think, uh, helped shape my, my academic interests. I was not uh, a, a very motivated academic student when I went to Chabot College, and when I left, I think I was. Um, because I met some professors there, especially in the English department, who really sort of took it upon themselves to try to help us young people make sense out of our world to use uh, uh, the, the, the discipline, the paradigm of literature study, English study, philosophy, to try to help us make us understand kind of our lives, the typical liberal arts education. But I think it's something that's, that's certainly, uh, the reason I'm here today is because of what I owe Chabot College, not just the coaches uh, who, who I had, uh, uh, wanted to spend my whole career trying to emulate, but, but also the professors that, that I think helped me uh, understand that, that, that academics could be important. Um, I had a wonderful career. I spent a lot of it at the University of Pacific, about 17 years, and I spent a lot of it on the Stanford campus, about 17 years. Um, University of Pacific, I'll talk just for a second about a little uh, uh, um, uh, information about it. It's the oldest school in California. First, first chartered institution, 1851 in Santa Clara. If you, our first campus was where Bellarmine Preparatory School is in Santa Clara. So we were down there, we were founded by Methodists. We were, in the first uh, 50 years, we were what called, they were called preachers and teachers. Um, so it was a two-year school, and, and our graduates either became Methodist ministers or became uh, teachers. Uh, we're, we're a small school. We have 4,000 uh, undergraduates on the Stockton campus. We have a law school and some ancillary schools in Sacramento and a dental school and some ancillary schools in San Francisco. But we're basically about 5,000 students. Um, we're different than a lot of other private schools. We're in the middle of the Central Valley of California in Stockton. And uh, um, if you think of the uh, um, social demographics 
uh, of, uh, of the Central Valley of California and you look at poverty rates, uh, um, uh, infant mortality, uh, rates of hunger, uh, educational rates, uh, uh, all the kind of social measures we use, the Central Valley of California struggles. We compare uh, just about equally with the Mississippi River Delta. All right, so we're a private school with selective entrance requirements, but we're in the middle of the Central Valley of California, and we have to be aware of that. One of the major changes we have is we have a very, compared to other private schools, we're in the West Coast Conference, so we compare ourselves to Santa Clara, and St. Mary's, USF, Pepperdine, uh, Loyola, University of San Diego, etc. cetera. Um, we have a much higher percentage of Pacific of first generation um, students. We're about 45% first college, first generation students. And uh, um, all of you guys, I think, probably know what BEOG eligible is. But if you take the, the it's, it's basically, uh, if you go to college, you go to a private school, you get a BEOG grant. If your family income, and I don't know what the numbers are this year, but let's say a, a family of four income below $45,000 a year. That's pretty much what BEOG has been uh, uh, for years. We have 38% of our students at Pacific receive BEOG grants. Uh, we have the highest rate, if you take the top, 50 private rated pri private schools in America, and uh, uh, we have the highest percentage of BEOG graduates and highest percentage of first generation students of any private school. So we're, we're we, you know, we look a lot like the Ivy League and we look a lot like a lot of other private schools, but we're really sort of a different campus out there in Stockton. We have a sort of a, a slightly different mission. The good news for me is, is that we get uh, about 200 students a year from junior college. We have matriculation agreements with a number of junior colleges, especially Chabot, or excuse me, Delta College in, in Stockton, where our students can go in, and if they take the right courses and they, and they uh, uh, get certain GPA, they're automatically admitted to the University of Pacific. We love those matriculation agreements. We think one way to offset the, the huge, significant $55,000 a year price tag at the University of Pacific is to encourage students to go to junior college first and then move to Pacific to get their bachelor's degree. It just makes economic sense. I I think, and I, I share President Ibeck, our president's feelings on this, probably one of the great uh, struggles that we're going to have in our society in the next 20 years is this huge debt we're loading on our students as they graduate. It's a new thing. When I graduated from Pacific, many of you graduated from college, it wasn't traditional that you carried debt. The average UOP student graduates with $19,000 in debt, and we're low compared to a lot of other people. So we have got to figure out a way to do it. And we at Pacific believe one of those ways to do that is for students, especially local students, to get their first two years of college at a junior college and then matriculate over. And we're working very hard um, uh, to do that. Pacific and Stanford, because I spent a lot of time there, have a lot of connections. Uh, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we started Stanford Medical School. Uh, back in 1856, we started a medical school, UOP did, and it was the first medical school west of the Mississippi. It eventually, after about 10 or 15 years, moved to San Francisco, became independent, and then became the uh, um, uh, Stanford Medical School. And, and in addition to that, Stanford's first entering class, if you ever listen to Stanford people, they'll say, we were organized 1891. Well, what happened was they organized the University in 1891, but the taxpayers of California sued the Stanford family to try to get some of the money back that, that they profited from the railroads, right? So, so uh, um, uh, Mr. Stanford was, Governor Stanford was, a, was, quote, a robber baron and made a lot of money off of, uh, uh, off of tax subsidies and the people of California tried to get that back. So the university was organized in 1891 but didn't matriculate its first class until 1894 when the Supreme Court of California ruled in favor of the Stanford family and the Stanford Trust and said they could keep the land, et cetera. But in, 19, in 1894, the first Stanford class had 180 students and 65 of them were UOP transfers because we were essentially a two-year school, they were becoming a four-year school. Um, a lot of people, and I, I, I really appreciate the kind things said about my, my years at Stanford, but a lot of people thought it, you know, at Stanford that we had, well, what a great job you have, Ted. Well, that, what, I, I can't believe, uh, or what a great, and, and it was a great job, uh, but, but they didn't have the band. Um, <laughs> uh, you ever heard of the Stanford band? <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to tell you a couple band stories. My first, my first experience with the Stanford band was when I was an assistant football coach. I was an assistant coach on Bill Walsh's staff in 1978, 79. And uh, um, we warmed up, we were playing Tulane in the, foot, in the stadium at Stanford and we warmed up the team. And, and George Seifert was the secondary coach and I was a linebacker coach. And after the warm up, the team went over there. And that, that old stadium, it took a long time to get to the press box. So George and I, instead of going to the locker room, we just went up and sat in the press box. So we're sitting in the press box and the, I wasn't really paying attention 
to what was going on on campus, but I guess the band had had some trouble, so they, they announced the pregame show, and they always at the same time say that, you know, we'd like to now announce their, or introduce the Lima Stanford Junior University marching band, da, 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 they were the thing, and they, and they start to do that. George and I are just sitting there with our headphones on waiting for the team to come out, and the announcer says, uh, um, in addition, the, the, we, the band, we have an announcement to make that only those band members, the president has ruled, the president of Stanford has ruled, that only those band members who've been to at least one practice this week will be allowed to march in the pregame show. <laughs> so now we'd like to introduce the band, and three guys walked out. <laughs> <laughs> and what they did is they, they walked out, they walked out the half of that field, and then they came out in the middle of the field, and the band announcer said, to, um, we're going to need your help. You have to use your imagination. Uh, the, he said the band will now form a map of the state of California and play California. Here we come. And the three kids kind of walked around. And I, that, that's when I knew this is going to be different. I, I, every time I come to L.A., I, and this is, uh, gee, I don't remember what year it was. I think it was in the 90s. But it was during the O.J. Simpson trial. So we come down to, we're going to play USC in the Coliseum. <coughs> And uh, um, we come down to a big alumni event at, for Stanford over in, uh, over in West L.A. And we get talking, and I give a couple talks, and we chat, and then I go back up to my room, and one of my staff members had called the, the hotel I was staying in and said, have you, have you looked at CNN? Have you, have you turned on CNN? And I said, no, so I turned on CNN, and there's our band. The band had come down to practice, and then after practice, they had driven over, they got their bus driver to drive them over to the O.J. Simpson trial. And they were outside the trial playing, uh, uh, playing different music, you know. And so it was like, oh my goodness. And of course, you can imagine in, in, in a community like you guys have, you know, you, and you know how you, you have so many constituents. We had some constituents who thought the band was the funniest thing they'd ever seen, and the other people thought that it was sacrilegious and the worst thing they'd ever seen. So we were sort of, I was always sort of caught between the two of these. And uh, um, so they, they start. They start playing this music, and of course, Johnny Cochran gets on. He's a UCLA guy, and he goes, we're going to kick your butt, and he's sort of going back and forth. And Shapiro gets on and says, this is a disgrace. I can't believe that there are dead people here, and what are, you know, what are we doing here? So I get, I get caught in the middle of the whole thing. So the, you can imagine the letters start flying in, because this made international news. And so then the area kind of died down, and we took some punishment. We took the kids out, you know, made them, made them stand out one game or something. I don't know, we did some kind of punishment for them. But, but after the O.J. Simpson uh, um, a verdict came in, um, I got a letter from a lady, a handwritten letter, saying, saying that, uh, you know, dear, dear Dr. Leland, uh, I was one of those people that complained about your band at the O.J. Simpson trial, and I just want to know that I've changed my mind. Um, uh, y your band is uh, uh, really visionary. Uh, they're the only ones that realize this was a mockery of justice from the very beginning, so. <laughs> I would say this, when I, when I was at Chabot, um, uh, we played against O.J. He was at CCSF at the time, and, they, and he was a, a great football player. And I remember I had some, some contact with him, at, uh, but being captains, all that stuff, and, and he, 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 was, he was quite a gentleman. So I, ha I had quite a different opinion of him than, than you see. Um, I talked a little bit about preparing here, and I want to say that I think some of the challenges that, that we talked a little bit about some of the challenges you guys may be facing in terms of uh, uh, um, things. And I, I want to say that there's, there's sort of the challenges that we have faced in college athletics. Um, one is new, new measures of student success. You know, in college athletics, we've been on a 15-year path of university presidents saying to the athletics departments, um, you know, you need to graduate more of your kids. Your kids need to disperse their majors. We need to make sure there's progress towards a degree. Um, we've got all of these uh, measures, and you guys have probably heard of the APR and all this stuff. But I, I want to say that uh, um, when, when this stuff originally started coming out, um, I was involved in assembly leadership, and I thought it was the dumbest stuff, and I, I was uh, pushed back against that. I thought each institution should manage their own academic progress towards a degree. Uh, when I was in the Ivy League, Princeton uh, always said, you know, we'll decide who's eligible. We, Princeton, we decide who's eligible, not the NCAA or anybody else. So they're always pushing back, and I kind of had that attitude. But I should say, after 15 years um, uh, of this movement within the NCAA, it's been really good. We, I think we now have programs in college athletics, for the most part, that are doing a better job at most levels of balancing academics and athletics in these kids' lives. And after all, to me, that's the toughest job we have. Balancing academics and athletics in these young people's lives is the hardest task that we have. And it doesn't matter whether you're at Stanford or Cal or Pacific or Chabot College or West Valley College. That's, to me, the big challenge that we have. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that. There's another, you know, stuff going on for you guys, some tightened eligibility. We've had the same thing within the NCAA. Again, I wasn't so sure it was so good. I kind of like the Princeton idea. 
but in the end, I have found it to be, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, very almost liberating the fact that we have these new eligibility requirements because it does, everybody's on the same page. When a student shows up, everybody knows, hey, here's, here's the hurdles you gotta get over and there's no, there's no room. You, you gotta do it and I think that it, it has been um, good. Most of these new eligibility requirements are fairly minimal too. It's not like you guys are gonna require a, uh, you know, a huge GPA to get into Harvard Medical School that we're going to require kids to all major in engineering. There, there's enough space for for uh, um, kids that, that are still challenged academically. Um, I, I know you have money challenges. We all do. Um, I think that the, we've been lucky in private schools in, in America. We've had a pretty good financial model over the last 20 years. Public schools, you guys included, have struggled much more. But I think there's ways to get around uh, um, uh, those financial struggles, but we, we, we share them too. And I think the last one is sort of a changing landscape in college athletics. And I don't think there's any, any, any uh, uh, um, doubt that, that college athletics is, is probably in an important time of change. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, so I'll get into the, sort of the, maybe the meat of what I want to talk about here. Um, and that's that. What I'm going to argue is that uh, it does start with us, and we need to we need to understand. I think we I hate when people say you need to. I worked with Dennis Green, the old football coach. Yeah, I worked with him at Northwestern, and then he was on Bill Walsh's staff and stuff. And he he used to say to me all the time, "They got to." Dennis would say, "They got to understand." I don't know if you had coaches like this. He's the admissions officers got to understand, and this guy's got to understand. And I would say, Dennis, they don't have to understand. You know, we've got to try to explain it to them, but they don't have to understand. Uh, um, and, and, but it does, I, I think it's really helpful if we, if, if, if all of us can sort of uh, understand the, the, the conflicts that we're in in college athletics that are sort of endemic to what we're doing. This all really got, it's been around the, co the collegiate model of, uh, and the, I would say the educational model of athletics is an American phenomenon and has really only been around for about 60, 70 years. The concept that education and athletics should be combined together is something that's nowhere else in the world. We have about 45 international students at the University of Pacific that are on our sports teams, and they marvel at why, you know, why, why does UOP have a tennis team? Isn't there a club in town? That's what they're all used to from Europe. They all play for their local clubs. It's not connected. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, uh, more about that. But it, the, the, it really got exacerbated, this argument uh, and I should say one of a Pacific guy, Amos Alonzo Stagg, um, is sort of the father of this idea of uh, education and athletics being combined. Uh, I'm, I'll, and I'll try to talk a little bit more about this. But it's really been exacerbated in 1984. In 1984, the, uh, um, it, the University of Oklahoma and the University of Texas sued the NCAA. So right now, at University of Pacific, we give our TV rights in basketball to the West Coast Conference, and all of us give our postseason rights to the NCAA to market. In those days, though, you, you guys are almost all too young to remember the ABC game of the week, but in those days, when I was playing, there was one game on Saturday, the ABC game of the week, and it was run by the NCAA. And the NCAA decided who got in and who didn't. And the NCAA also distributed money in 1972, when I was an assistant football coach, University of Pacific got $225,000, which you can extrapolate now as to about $2 million in, in, in today's dollars, from the NCAA for not being on TV. Or they said, we're going to have one game on, everybody want to watch it, you know, it was always Texas, Oklahoma, or something like that. And Pacific, we love your program, we'll give you money, stay off TV. Well, in 84, the, the uh, um, the Texas and uh, I think it was Oklahoma or maybe Georgia sued the NCAA, went to the Supreme Court saying that the NCAA does not have the right to take away our TV. We should be able to market our TV on our own. Um, what was the NCAA doing at the time? They were saying to Oklahoma, Texas, if you take your TV off, you're out of the NCAA and your athletes can't compete in swimming track or anything. You're out of the NCAA. So that was the, that was the same. And, and what happened was the NCAA sided with Texas. And they said, you, you, the NCAA cannot uh, um, abrogate the rights to market football. So then it became, everybody, in effect, what happened to football, then you gave it, everybody gave it to their conference. So now we have the Pac-12 and the, and the Big 12 and all those guys. But here, here's a comment that Wizard White, you know, who was a, who was a uh, um, 
a, a uh, Rhodes Scholar and a great football player at, at the University of Colorado, but a Supreme Court Justice said at the time, he dissented. So seven justices said, you know, that you can't uh, uh, restrict the right of fair trade, and uh, two said this is wrong, and here's the dissent. Uh, although some in the NCAA activities can be viewed in isolation, bear a resemblance undertaken by professional sports organizations and associates. The court errs, and he's saying we're made, we may wrong, in treating intercollegians under, under the NCAA as a truly commercial venture, in which colleges and universities participate solely or even primarily for the pursuit of profit. That's accordingly I dissent. So it was Rehnquist and White dissented in that case. But what, that's what happened in 84, that that's when things started. That's when the escalation of dollars into college athletics started because it all came back, it all comes back from football. What's happened lately has been the dynamics of, of action TV and your DVR and all that stuff. And what's happened now is the TV people have realized that um, live athletics is about the only thing you can't tape and watch later. It's about the only thing you can't watch on your hand held device. It's the one thing that will get people to sit down and watch a game at that time and go through the commercials. Because the rest of this stuff is all getting downloaded by Yulu and Hulu and all, it's all going to change. You know, I, I think, but the one thing people hang on, so the rights fees have just skyrocketed. To give you an example, um, this is what, so one day I got asked a couple months ago, you know, who's running college athletics in CSPN? There's no question about it. Well, what's the, how do ESPN doing that? Well, here's the, here's the statistics. ESPN gets about $9 for every hookup they have. So my Comcast video at home, I have ESPN, and I pay my Comcast bill, and Comcast pays ESPN $9 because I'm hooked up. 115 million hookups in America. And that's $9 a month. Right? The next highest... HBO and all those guys are down about $2. So ESPN is way above, now ESPN2 is $4. I get ESPNU, that's two, I mean, I pay about $20 a month that goes straight to ESPN, 110 million hookups. So you think, yeah, extrapolate that out, that's $12 billion a year income for ESPN and they haven't sold a bit of advertising yet. And they sell just as much as anybody else. So you think, well, ABC's making money on, on with, with just, you know, with just putting stuff over the broadcasting, and CBS does the Final Four, they just broadcast it. ESPN not only broadcasts it, but it has the, uh, it has the, uh, um, the cable fees coming into it. I was on the Rose Bowl Management Committee when we negotiated one contract, it was about 2004, we were negotiating with ABC. Rose Bowl's been on ABC forever, and we were gonna go with ABC, and the Rose Bowl people on ABC, so we're dealing with ABC, and it's kind of like nobody's fooling each other. They're gonna pay us what they wanna pay us, and it's gonna go up, because we're gonna go with them, and we don't have any competition, and they know they, they gotta have the Rose Bowl, so we sort of negotiate this thing out, and it was a 10% you know, increase in rights fees over the year before some, and then the ABC guy said, you know, we own ESPN. I said, yeah, we know you own ESPN. He said, well, if you let them in the room, this number, whatever the number was, you know, this, let's say it's $400 million, this number changes. Really? ESPN changes that number? Yeah, ESPN changes. ESPN comes in the room, the $400 million becomes $600 million, and ESPN wants it to have it once every four years. That's all they wanted. When now it's on all the time. Because they have so much more money, ESPN does, than all of the other people combined. But what it's driven and I want to talk a little bit about this, is this is another quote, I, I love quotes, I was going to put them all up here, but I, I gave a presentation like this one time to our Board of Regents at Stanford, and the, one of the uh, uh, victims of my presentation described it as death by PowerPoint. So I, I don't want to, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to do that, but, but here, here's, a, here's a, 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 a faculty rep from Stanford said, inside big time athletics, tangible rewards, money rewards, are so strong and it, it, that change must come from outside the system. The battle is between the values of higher education and the reward structure of big time college athletics. Right, there's no question. Now I think I wanna extrapolate this a little bit down to, to your world because I think there's, when you look at the, what I call the big entertainment model of college athletics, I think to be fair, I think to be fair in this, you have to really not call it big entertainment. I think it's, it's, it's high performance. Because there's sort of, there's an element of athletics which is about performance. 
You know, I talk about education and building character and, and time of your life and the greatest moments of your life. And, and, and we laughingly tell the coaches, yeah, and, and you go into the huddle with two minutes to go in a basketball game, you start talking about character building, they're going to knock you down and throw you out of there. You know, they're interested in winning that game. That's what this thing's about. And I've been around national championship teams and, and in, in, I think, 16 different sports. And, and I will say this, when that competition comes, there is no place in there for somebody that's not ready whether it's the swimming pool or the basketball court or, or the lacrosse field, whatever it is. Um, there is something to be said in what we do for acknowledging um, uh, high performance. So it's not just about money. Money sort of comes with it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, um, I'll give you some other quotes. This is, uh, um, so let me. Very lucky if this works. Matter of fact, my staff at Pacific will marvel. <laughs> it buzzed. There we go. So I want to argue is there's there's two athletic models. One is what I call the high performance model. And the other one is the educational model. And what I'm going to do is use this slide here. And I promise I only have one more. All right. Yeah, in fact, I even think I skipped over, so maybe this is the last one. It is, what, what I'm going to try to do is contrast and talk to you about how difficult this management is, right? And how, if you look at the entertainment model, the high performance model, how different it is from the educational model. And, uh, and, and how we have to work hard to combine the two. So, one's a big business, big entertainment model. Let's talk about what these things look like. In one of them, the values are extrinsic. In the big entertainment, big, big uh, high performance model, the, the values come from without. This is, this is an external reward. This is like the, when I was in graduate school, the little, uh, I had one of those little rats in a Skinner box and you had to push the little thing until the light went on. That's, you know, we, we fed him if he did it the right way, or it could have been a she, they did it the right way. Um, those are about extrinsic rewards. We're trying to reward someone for their performance, and the reward comes from without. This isn't about feeling good. This, this is about winning. On the other model, though, the educational model, the, the rewards are intrinsic. They're to, they're to the person. They, they, this is what we, when I took my first philosophy of uh, physical education course uh, um, centuries ago, this is what we called education through the physical. We're using physical movement to teach other things. We have in Stockton quite a, uh, uh, a youth program for young people, we went with our, our school of uh, um, music, our conservatory of music went down to Venezuela and stole it. Uh, it's called El Sistema. You've seen it on 60 Minutes, but it's basically teaching little kids uh, uh, how to play classical music. We have these little violins, and we have about four, high, four grammar schools in Stockton, and every day after, after, after class they do this, and they, they put on performances, and they learn how to play, and, they, and sometimes they get pretty good, and it's, a, it's quite a, a wide community effort called El Sistema. Why do we do it? It's not so they can play music. It's because they graduate from high school at twice the rate of the rest of the kids, and they're more likely to aspire to go to college. They have less uh, um, absences from school. We do this El Sistema thing because it does other things that the community supports. And, and this model to the right, the intrinsic model, you know, 92% of American parents, when asked, do you think sports participation is good for the social and character development of your children, 92% of parents say yes, right? And that, this is an American cultural belief. I had to laugh when uh, um, the, all the bribing scandals about the last uh, um, World Cup uh, uh, championships going to Dubai or wherever they're going, and there was talking about bribery and everything, and one of the American reporters asked the head of FIFA, said, don't you feel badly about the, about the role model you're providing for, with all this uh, graft and uh, sort of uh, immoral stuff happening? And his response was, this is soccer. You know, it has nothing to do with morality. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to win, you know? See, in America, we, we, don't, we don't look at it that way, I think. And, and uh, this is the old, uh, um, or the Battle of Waterloo was won on the fields of Eton, right? This is the old British public school feeling that a sound mind and a sound body work together to make a sound citizen. You know, and the lessons that you learn in sport. Now, I, I, you can tell I only spend a little bit of time on it, and I'm spending a lot of time on this because I, 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 I happen to to believe the one to the right. 
Um, but let's talk about winning. And, and one, winning is primary. That's all that matters. Another one, winning is secondary, right? You really, it's not how you win, and I win and lose, it's how you play the game. Really? You talk to college athletes, yeah, you walk in the huddle, you know, gee, I know you lost, but it's not really, you, you really played well. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to punch you in the head. Get out of the way. We're not happy. We lost. We came here to win. We didn't win. Um, and one money is important, one, one money is not important. And we know that money will change people's values. We know from social science research that if you take someone who does a, a, uh, an activity for, uh, for the fun of it, or for intrinsic rewards, and you reward them, you will extinguish, their, ex extinguish I'm going to call it, extinguish their, their reward. Their, their internal rewards, right? They will quit. They will start saying, I'm doing this because I'm paid. The great experiment was done, and hey, I, you can just got to imagine this. Um, we had some many people at Stanford, and when I was getting my PhD in psychology, that, that we had, there's a nur two nursery schools in, uh, on the Stanford campus. Of course, we have double mirrors, and we're filming them, and everything's an experiment there, right? So what they did was, we, they, said they, had, they did this right before I went. I don't know if I ever want to enroll my kids in there, because I thought, oh, wow. But, but they, what they did is they, is they watched, the, there was a 15-minute recess every morning, and they watched the little kids. Uh, um, and they, they charted what, they, what the kids did. And they could, they could go outside and play. They could play with, with a build a fort. They could say, and one of the things they could do is finger paint. And they charted it, and they found out over a period of time, you know, the, that 15% that of the kids finger painted. Then they went in. So they, they, you could argue they were intrinsically rewarded, intrinsically motivated to finger paint. Then they went in and paid the kids. They gave them chocolate if, if, if you'll finger paint. Everybody finger painting, right? You just imagine, they got us all these kids finger hundred percent compliance with finger painting. Right? Then they quit giving them the chocolate. What happened? Nobody finger painted. Nobody finger painted. You ask them why don't you finger paint? And they say, because I'm not being paid. Not being paid. When I, I think I met some some Davis people here. Um, when I was at Pacific as a as a young coach, we used to give scholarships. We had like 100 scholarships, and we played Davis. They didn't have any scholarships. They were really pretty good in football, and we had pretty good games against them. Um, and when I was there, we sort of we won most of the time, but towards the end of Pacific having football, Davis won more. So it was a, it was a, good, it was, it was a good set of games. And we did a study when I was a, got my master's degree. We asked all the UOP players and one other school, San Jose State, asked the football players, if you could play a fifth year, if you could play another year of football, would you and under what conditions? And then we asked Davis and Chico State, which were non-scholarship schools, if you could play another year of football, would you and under what conditions, what did we find? The Pacific and the San Jose kids, even though they were, you could argue they were better football teams, um, said, you know, only if I'm scholarship and I don't really want to play another year. And almost all the Davis and Chico kids said, yeah, if I could play another year, I'd play another year. I love, I love what I do. And the level of competition was not here and there. It was pretty equal competition. One group was rewarded and paid. The other group wasn't. That was the difference. So we know that if you go into someone and something where people are intrinsically rewarded, you can destroy that, that, that reward structure. One takes a fanatical commitment to athletics. The other one takes a balanced commitment to athletics. I mean, I, when I was in Palo Alto, I would say to our staff every year, I'd line them all up, and I'd say, you know, you know what? This is a room of fanatics. Division I college athletics, we will win national championship. If you're not a fanatic, get out of the room. Because your athletes are fanatics. Coaches are fanatics. Everybody's a fanatic. So if you're not a fanatic, it, it, this probably isn't for you. But it, 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 on the other side, this, it, you know, we see this educational thing is don't, don't get too, you know, don't get to, it's just part of what you do. As a well-rounded human being, athletics is part of what you do. Let's not go crazy. When I was at Dartmouth College, we had a great, for, I don't know why, we had no scholarships. We're in the middle of New Hampshire, which is still, I think, got about like six feet of snow today. Um, and we had a great cross-country team. We had two Olympians, uh, um, Jim Zapianza and uh, Bob Kempinen. Right? I mean, we could really run. There were Americans in, in, in the sport of college cross country. A lot of them are non-Americans, so we were really good. We finished second in the NCAA championship. No scholarships, high entry requirements, middle of New Hampshire. We finished second in the NCAA championships in cross country. We got beat by Arkansas with all their, all their great athletes. And it, I mean, this was something that, this doesn't happen in the Ivy League. Everybody's going nuts, everybody in campus going nuts. I'm walking across campus and one of our uh, uh, vice presidents walks through the ring. Hey, see, this is exactly what he said to me. He said, hey, uh, congratulations on that cross country team. That was really something. I said, yeah, they're great kids. You know, these kids are all going to be doctors. And they're wonderful kids. And he said, yeah, congratulations on, on that. And then he said, but Ted, I'm going to ask him, do we really want to be that good? Do we really want to be that good? 
Uh, and of course, my response is, we got a whole building of people that want to be that good. You know, I, I don't know all the all the kids I know that are 18 year olds want to be that good. But uh, um, but there's sort of this idea that it should be balanced, not fanatical. Um, I'll go down this. It, this is the last one I'll go through in depth because we're ru running out of time. But really, the, the, the one on the left is a, is a test of courage, determination, and skill. You know, if, if, if you're not good enough, get out. You don't belong. This is for high, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that, that, uh, um, uh, uh, that, this, that this attitude isn't among the, the teams that are in the Final Four. You better be not only talented, but you better be tough, and you better be skillful if you're going to be at this level. And the other one is, the other model on the right is develops courage, determination, skill. The job in that milieu is, is to develop courage, determination. We don't kick kids out. We want, to have, we want to invite them in. They're not quite as good. That doesn't really matter. We can work this thing out, all right? Because we want as many in the tent as we can, because we believe we're del delivering a societal value. I'll go through these adult, uh, there's a different role for adults in these. Uh, one's a vocation, one's an avocation. Only the talented participate. I just sort of talked about that. Uh, only the, only the um, uh, and one we want broad participation. One is of the physical, you know, that I just explained to you sort of uh, through the physical and the other one is of the physical, right? So, so that means that we're really just talking about um, uh, uh, developing physical prowess. Let me read some quick quotes. Sport was our main occupation of all of us. It continued to be mine for a long time. It was where I had my only lesson in ethics. Albert Camus, probably the greatest existential philosopher in Western society in the last hundred years, says to us that the only place he learned ethics was in sports. I want to read this one to you. This is my favorite one. This is by Michael Spence, who was a colleague of mine at Stanford. He won the Nobel Prize in economics and uh, uh, was the dean of our business school. And his is, this is, he won an award at Princeton, and his is, this was taken out of his uh, uh, speech at Princeton for the, accepting this award. So, Michael Spence, I was very fortunate to be admitted to Princeton, and the education I received there changed my life permanently. But I understand the physical, mental, emotional, and social components of playing ice hockey were the most critical part of my Princeton education. Nobel Prize winner saying, when I look back on it, you know, this, ath this athletic thing meant more to me. Let me give a, a few from the other hand. This is my favorite one. If people think intercollegiate athletics isn't a business, then they must think General Motors is a charity. Um, <laughs> that's Bobby Knight. Um, <laughs> And here's another one, college football, and, and I think this is, a, this is a good one by, by Harry Antron from the New York Times. College football on the one hand is a great American spectacle and galvanizes and broadens the university's appeal. On the other, it's a money draining, values compromising orgy of indulgence. On any, this is written a little while ago. On any, on any given Saturday or Tuesday, if you're a Big East follower, football is a cultural benefit or a classic betrayal, depending on the eye of the beholder. Right. So the, 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 the thing I want to, the, the purpose I want to talk about this is because I, I have found this, when I see things happening in athletics, I, I find this sort of continuum, this dichotomy as interesting. Now what I believe in is this uh, values um, uh, challenge is going to be with us forever. It's part of athletics. The other thing I'd say is we're not the only organization in the world that has this. One of my favorite uh, 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 comments is, it, it, uh, uh, is the, what we call the genius of and. What's the genius of and? Well, Jerry Porras, a faculty member at Stanford, wrote a book uh, called Built to Last. If you want to know something about sort of how to build a great organization, you read this book, Built to Last. And what he did is he went back in the 20s and 30s and 40s and found two companies in the same business, two tire companies, two car companies, two uh, steel manufacturing companies. And then he studied those companies, two in each, and then computed which one 50 years later is still functioning and still showing a profit. And what were the differences? What were the differences between the two tire companies? One's now thriving, one's extinct. Two steel companies, one thriving, one. And what he found was a commonality that he called the genius of and. In other words, he believed that the companies that were successful over a long period of time were able to blend different value sets within their organization. They didn't just have one mission, they had a couple missions blended together. And I think in athletics, we need to blend these two missions. I, I would even look in a department like I, when I was in Stanford. We, I mean, I think all of our baseball players at Stanford had professional aspirations. Every one of them. 
You say, what do you want to do? I'm going to play, I'm going to play at the next level. That's what they would say. You go to our rowing team and our squash team, and you know, no, there's no next level. You know, they're in, a, they're, they're in a different, and we even talk to kids on the team. You talk to some football players, and boy, they're into this. I'm going to the next level, and that's what I want to do. Other football players on the same team. No, no, I'm in this, I, I, I'm, I'm in this to learn lessons in life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on and do something else outside of the athletic realm. So I think there's, there's, there's room for both of these. The key for us is to combine them both, and my, so that's what I'm calling the G's fan, and I think the way to do that is to emphasize the right type. Because in my opinion, especially nowadays with social media and stuff, the days of just being able to emphasize winning and winning isn't going to work. We had better take, uh, a, all of us who, who believe in athletics, had better take a holistic approach to developing our students and our student athletes if we're going to, if we're going to survive and if we're going to prosper. I would argue with you, and this is the argument I've been making for 20 years, maybe for 30 years, is that the best way to win is to emphasize the right-hand side is to make sure that you, on your daily basis, are values, educationally values driven in what you do, and the, right, the left side will take care of itself. That'll be there. And if you have a great athlete, they'll, they'll be able to take advantage of all these things. But you've got, we've got to be motivated by the right-hand side. That's one of the reasons why I was glad I got out of athletics when I did, out of big, big, big time college athletics. Because I don't think, if you believe in the way I believe, I don't know if you could survive as a big time athletic director now. It means people call me up and say, would you like to, you know, would, Ted, would you think about this job? And I'm like, well, first of all, I got to retire. You know, my, my wife and I want to retire soon. But the other one is I have no interest. I didn't get in this business to fly to New York City and negotiate with ABC. It's just really not interesting to me. The, the guys that are in big time athletics now, that's interesting to them. That's what they see themselves. I, I, I care more about the women's soccer team than I do about going to, because I love soccer and I love female athletes. I mean, I just love the whole, I love being part of it. So I guess, what, to, to try to clear this thing up, these, these, you, you gotta be able to manage both of these every day, uh, but I would suggest that in order to take advantage of both of them, you emphasize the educational side, because that's really uh, where we're going. And I think that's, in the end, how are you gonna justify your program? The way we justify our program at Pacific, our faculty give us about $15 million a year to run an athletic program. So our budget's about 18 million, we bring in about three million, the faculty give us the other 15 million. I say faculty, you know, private schools, faculty run the place, right? And, and they give it to us. Why do they do it? It's not because, it's not because of the big, business, big entertainment model. It's because they believe that it contributes to the quality of life of our student athletes. And if you look at, I did this the other day in our, if you look at the BOP website, um, there are uh, uh, 10 um, distinguished alumni, and luckily I'm not one of them, but there are 10 distinguished alumni, I think, on there, and uh, seven of them were athletes at Pacific of all of our graduates and our graduates right now we're about we're about 11 or 12 percent of the student body so I do believe that athletics uh, does uh, build all the kind of character things that we that we all believe it should and I think we can't shy away from from that you can still win and I think as you watch you can still win and run a humanistic humane athletic program uh, I, I believe and I matter of fact I think that's that's what you have to do so whew, we're done thank you <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Leland, uh, entertaining and certainly um, very informative. And if you don't mind, we'll make this available to our folks on our website so that you don't have to take pictures or scratch it all down. Um, you have time for one or two questions? Anyone have any questions out there? So the question was, do we have a chance to get the community college story out there on television? So, so let me respond. Yes, I think there is. I, I think that, but let, let me tell you two quick stories. We all remember, well, not you guys, because I'm so much older than all you. I remember when ESPN started, and the idea was they were going to put on 
sort of uh, non-traditional sports. They were going to have uh, curling from Canada, and they were going to have uh, lacrosse and you know barrel jumping, and that's all the stuff that ski jumping. And by the way, we had a ski jump at uh, when I was at Dartmouth. And, and I don't care what you see on TV, it's a straight drop down. Uh, the ski jump goes like this and then it goes straight, you know, it always looks like they're flying. They're not, they're falling. Um, I just, I, I just, I just want to, I just want to, I just want to tell you that. But, but the ESPN started and they've migrated, their financial model has migrated to doing the traditional sports, the ones that have, uh, uh, that, draw, that draw the TV money, right? Um, one thing that we're doing, in, I know in the West Coast Conference, in, 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 as, as production costs have become cheaper, um, we, we are ending up um, with very little cost uh, putting almost all of our athletic contests on the web. So we have a, West Coast Conference has a WTV. I would, uh, and, and that's so, uh, every West Coast Conference tennis match, soccer games, they're all on the web and you can watch it. And the, and the cameras are pretty good nowadays. And we get, you know, 500 people watch a soccer game and the, the parents get to watch it. Um, I think that might be the future. In other words, I, I've been arguing with my friends in the Pac-12. The Pac-12, so the West Coast Conference, us little guys, we, we didn't have enough um, interest to, to go you know, get our own uh, over the over the cable network. So we're doing this WTV, which is you lock on your computer and you can send. It. But you know, all TVs being sold now are computer uh, uh, savvy, right? So you, you're going to be able to watch everything you can watch on your thing, watch on your TV, and the acuity is unbelievable. So the West Coast, the big, the big, the Pac-12 decided to invest all this money. You know, the, the Pac-12 TV network is not generating any dollars back to the Pac-12 yet because they're spending all their money on production. Because this is expensive. We're at WTV, we have uh, students putting on our, our games, and it works really great. And so I, I would say to you, maybe the future of getting it in there isn't in commercial TV. There may not be a lot of dollars for you, but exposure for the kids. I mean, the, the technology out there, you guys, is unbelievable. Our, our basketball teams, and we're, we're right in the middle of the our basketball teams play a game. They all have iPads. They play a game. They drop the iPad off. They play the game. At the end of the game, they walk back. They pick up the iPad, and the game's in there, broken down. They can follow themselves. They can. It's computerized. The whole thing's ready to go. So I think that's the way. To, I, I would go with with computer. All six of our tennis courts have a little, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's like a forty-five dollar camera up at the top of a thing, and we can we can televise all six of our tennis matches, and we get students to do it, and the students do the play-by-play. -play. They love it. We, you know, you guys have students that would just enjoy that. So that, I think that's the way to go. Not the, the big TV things, I think, is going more towards the traditional. Is there anyone else? Well, thank you, guys. Well, on, uh, on behalf of the 3C2A membership, we wanted to give you a couple of mementos from, from this. One is, and the other one is the world-famous juice box <laughs> that uh, people have, those of you who threw it away, go find it, okay? It's, uh, it's a battery charger that uh, um, some smart marketing person decided to put in a juice box. Quite ingenious. So, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Leland. Our next session is due to start in this room uh, in about 10 minutes. So uh, talk amongst yourselves.